All right, Des, thank you so much for your time. I know you're quite busy and uh, juggling quite a few things always at the same time. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Sorika. It's always a pleasure, my friend. I would like to start, I'll ask you, can you just describe a little bit of your life? Because I think it's, it's got a little bit of a, a big impact in the, the path that you chose or the, your life before your professional sort of permaculture career took off and, um, and the early beginnings as well. Um, yeah, well, my, my, um, thanks for, for all of that. Uh, my, um, life is underpinned by a few events. Um, one is, uh, my father's conscription to the Australian army in 1966. Um, I don't know if you know, Ulrico, but, uh, when, when we were involved in the Vietnam war, um, or this, or the American war, as they call it quite rightly, um, that uh, Australians were conscripted, so you know, their numbers were put in a barrel, like a bing- like they played bingo. And if your birthday came up, then you got conscripted. So, um, so my father got conscripted to that, and then uh, just three weeks after he arrived there, when I was three months old, uh, he was killed. And so I was raised on my on my grandparents' farm, my maternal grandparents' farm, because mum mum was there. She didn't have a husband to. In the house. So my great, my maternal grandparents were really great farm people, and um, granddad set up the property following key line principles. Um, so I was fortunate to have that principles in, in so far as the all of the water systems, but not all of the tree systems or the access, or, or so, definitely not the soils. Um, so he. Uh, but he did. We did have all the water that we needed, and I operated that system from a, from being a very young child. They he was also raised during the depression, and so a lot of what he, um, as a rural man, as a young man growing up in the depression um, in the nineteen twenties and thirties, um, he learned a lot of rural skills. He worked, you know, he he did a lot of different things, and so he felt it really important that for me. Because he, I know, he, I never talked to him about this, but I think because I was fatherless, um, I think he took it upon himself um, to to help me as a father would, as yeah. a grandfather would. So he sort of took me under his arm and um, under his wings. And even though mum remarried uh, when I was about two or three, um, he was always the main father figure in my life. And I spent most of my spare time and holidays, etc at the farm because it was always my first home. So with him and my Nana as well, um, who was like a lot of women of her era were really great, um, not at managing not only eight children and I was kind of like the ninth. Um, um, she was a grandmother at 44 with me. So quite young. Um, and she was a really great home economist. Um, she used to preserve all of her own food. Um, they made their own soap together from all of the animals that we killed. Um, had a really great garden. Um, used to so- cycle all sorts of things, you know. So there was a lot of that going on, and um, and family and being prepared was a very very big ethic in our fam- in our family. Um, always having enough, even though you didn't have monetary wealth. Yeah, it's it's um. It's amazing to me. Thank you for that. I've, I've come from a similar sort of story. Um, mm. My grandfather was a, he was from the communist party in Brazil mm-hmm. and he was chased when the, the mm. dictatorship that went kicked in in 64. Yeah. So I was par- partially raised in a farm and the scenario is pretty similar, although I'm just a little bit younger. It's the same yeah. thing. You know, there's a whole bunch of things that today would be considered as hard labor and for them it was just normal. Oh yeah, yeah I, I, I never saw it as hard labour. Although I've got a bit of a sore back today from yesterday. Uh, <laughs> I used to, well, Granddad used to with my cousins. Um, he'd all, who were all younger than me. Um, he'd always play them. He'd always play us off each other and tell you you're stronger than this one. And of course, if he said that, then you'd try to outdo each other or lift That's a heavier right. log or do something stronger. But um, I don't think my back is in as good a condition as it could be at my age for that reason, but uh, I do what I can. And all the computer work as well doesn't help, does it? No, it doesn't. At all. Uh, no, that's probably more responsible. I, should, I, shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't sling my grandfather for that. 
But that was all that was all a big thing and then um and really formative and I always will honor Nana and Grandad for that and and my mother as well because uh, she was part of that too as a very young woman. She was only twenty one when she had me, or just turned twenty one, which is really young for a person yeah. to have a child these days, especially these days. Um and and to go through, you know, she lost her she lost her husband and all of the it's it's hard work. Um, I know people's this happens all the time um, and your heart just goes out to people when uh, they have these things happen to them because you know you know what it's like yourself to an extent but I would say the other part the other thing that was big for me was um, you know I was never good at school um, I always turned up um, but I never was good at it and um, and when I left school I traveled around Australia and became involved in hospitality and I think that that was a really good thing um, it just happened you know it wasn't planned or just happened because that was a convenient job for someone who didn't have any who didn't have any qualifications um, was waiting tables and all of that sort of thing and I found myself being because I was raised to be polite um, I was always raised to say please thank you good you manners know, and, yeah. And, and, yeah just have good manners um, then that that go, that went a long way in in hospitality and got, got you a little bit in the kitchen as well didn't it well yeah ultimately i was in I, I did get in the kitchen and um but i i was qualified as a chef de rong which is a fine fine dining chef ultimately so um yeah cooking in a tuxedo um with my assistant my commie and uh, the big flambés and the wallahs with the cloches <laughs> and it was a lot of fun uh, if i one of those things that people ask me what sort of job I'd have. I, I just loved that job. It was so it was theatre. It was very theatrical. Mm. We were, but the important thing about that Oriko was that we were using. I was working with, a, with with at that time Australia's youngest executive chef at an international hotel in Tasmania, Brett Hansen, and he was right into local food. And this was 1988 or something like that. So you know, better part of 30 years ago now. And um, he so we got to know all of these uh, well all of these Tasmanian organic farmers and local farmers were taught turning up at the back door and we were it was sort of like Christmas every day because they come with all of this produce and it was yeah. all new and we were a young brigade in both front of house and back of house so we're all really interested in it and we all hung out together and went to night clubbing together and you know we we're a big family and um and we talked, we just lived and breathed this stuff. So that was a, a segue to me becoming an organic um, a grocer when I left hospitality because the hours were shit. And, and, I, and I did that for two or three years. I managed the local organic sh um, food store grocery here in Bendigo, my hometown. And um, that, that I, I was out with farmers all of the time. And here in central Victoria, it's one of the epicenters of organic production in the world. Um, and, and it was then, it still is. And so I was further exposed to all of these farmers. And I found that farmers were using me as a, as a vehicle to get information about what other farmers were doing. And that's really subtly where my consulting career started. And really my consulting career um, to, with, uh, with the exception of the design pass, part really hasn't changed since then because it's really about, oh, this person's doing this. Have you thought about doing that as well? Or, you know, it's about looking at one person's scenario and applying that to someone else's. And so that's, and that's pretty well the basis of my work today. I think there's a, a, a huge success in your work that has got to do with that in the sense that um, you were client driven. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, some people, they have this sort of model that they want to work in in design or whatever, and they want to push that forward. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I've thought about that a lot. Um, not in those terms that I'm client, climate, client driven, but um, which I certainly have been. I think design was interesting and the permaculture, well, when I did key line uh, in 1993, before I did key line and permaculture courses for the first time. And both of those courses, um, I wouldn't say promoted a client-driven approach. Um, they, they applied a, like, it's kind of like you're imposing design on the landscape and the clients just have to fit in with that. Well, that's how I saw it. Anyone may be wrong. And, and as a result, 
um, you, well, I found myself ultimately when I reflected on that years later that, um, that I was making the landscape do things that it didn't necessarily want to do or it should do or that the client didn't. It was more about me expressing myself on the landscape through design as opposed to the landscape um, and the client's complete wishes, particularly the client's expressed wishes being fulfilled. Now, in a lot of cases, that, that's not the case. It just happened to work out. But then I reflect on it in quite a few cases. That's not the case. So, But now my work has sort of come full circle and it is, I mean, I barely do any design work now because what we do now is we train people how to do their own design work. And that's, um, I, uh, you know, so that people are ultimately self-determined and that's and a really big part of my work now is self-determination. And it imparts in people autonomy as well, because if they hire you, you come up with all these systems and then they, they will have to be bringing you all the time to ask, what, what should I do? What should I do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you start to create dependencies. And I know that I've seen this a bit. I never really promoted that too much. Um, uh, it's funny because I tried to, in my work um, early on, I'm probably overcompensated by having really, really, really detailed designs, having a fantastic crew that I worked with. Um, and, you know, what... Our, our designs were basically WYSIWYG designs because we did it all digitally. And we was, I think we we're some of the first people in the world to do this where we, you know, we had a really high grade contour map. We did the design completely digitally and we basically did 3D, what I call 3D landscape printing. Mm. Um, we went out into the landscape and what was on the plan was exactly what was on the landscape. And it's, you know, it's great. We go to people like, I went to people like Campbell Mercer's property a few weeks ago who I developed in 2000, 2000, I designed in 2000, we developed in 2001. I was and about, yeah, yeah was that, that, that property, you know, every tree is exactly where we plotted it on the digital design. You know, it's, it's quite remarkable. It must be very fulfilling for you to visit these places that you have designed and see them working. Yeah. Well, that's, that's I, the, I suppose this is the thing I, I, I was saying this to Campbell the other day. I said, Oh geez, I, I, I really have nostalgia for those days because we had, we had a good team. We were going out doing all of that work, but it was still, it was still not what I'm talking about today. It wasn't self-determined. Mm. Um, you know, so much of what we're doing now is putting it all on the client. Um, and I wonder, I still wonder, you know, what's the business model there for doing what we used to do, um, where you're, where you are the designer developer. Um, I think that, I think uh, when I reflect on that a bit, I think that we could certainly work with clients to, or work with a client to have the design outcomes put up, put up to a point because they, they may not necessarily have all the digital skills that, and that's where I think, you know, it's like a, it's like a house design, you know, you go to a, you go to a draftsman um, with, with your sketch and then the draftsman has got the CAD skills to do it. Now, who's going to build that for you? Well, you may well be an owner builder, but you might still need an electrician to come in. And that's kind of the way I look at this. Or, or like most people, you might actually need someone. You can put your labor in, but you might need someone to come and grab your hands and say, do this. Do yeah, that. sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 So that's what. I think um, I think my, the next phase of my life, because um, we're we're full time carers of my mother in law, so I think um, when that phase changes, she's ninety five, then um, I'll be looking at potentially doing that again. Because I there is a lot, there is a tremendous amount of fulfilment in going out into the landscapes and uh, and walking through them. <laughs> uh, I'm 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 signing up for it. <laughs> Need helpers? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'll have any problem getting anyone to help. <laughs> no, you won't. But I'll, I'll, fight, I'll fight my way too. It's, it's um, interesting that you position yourself like that because you've actually spent time with some of the greatest people in permaculture. So in a way, you, there's a depart from that imposing design uh, way of work, working. And there's a depart as well in, uh, like I say, you're very client driven, whereas most of the, uh, not all of them, but most of the permaculture uh, pioneers, they were, they were very kind of uh, impo they imposed their will, they imposed their design. They, it was very like, strong people. And you spent time with all of them um, and somehow came out 
um, different on the other end. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I still see it. Um, every designer, I think, has their signatures. And in some ways, you can, well, I can see, because I, a lot of people don't realize, you know, I spend a bit of time vicariously looking at other people's work. Uh, I do that because I'm generally interested, just like I look at, you know, I've got books on landscape architecture and I really enjoy looking at the work that people do. Um, I love looking at Capability Brown's portfolio and so on because I'm trying to go, why did they do this? You know, so there's, there's that sort of thing. But I do see, unfortunately, a, a lot of folks um, go and put these signature um, structures on the landscape. The swale phenomena, for example, out of permaculture, the real classic um you know the you can't and it's kind of sad because it undermines the the great value of permaculture when people do that because they're really this they're putting all of these structures in without really um contemplating a what their hydrological effects are b what the effect on the pocketbook is and and how necessity how you know where's the return on investment for the client and c um, just how how they could actually be working on the effects, not the causes of the need to even have a swale. So there's there's just one example, but I I look at that and I go, gee, you could do better. And who's and I, I see a bit of myself in that from years gone by, where again you're imposing your will on the landscape as opposed to getting in a relation in a three way relationship with you the landscape and the client. And, and I find that, um, you know, it's like a few people out there that I look at in the permaculture space that they just cannot help themselves from doing particular things, particularly with earthworks. Um, and that, that if they don't do it, then that's, that doesn't make it, it's not Instagrammable, you know, it's not a, it's, <laughs> it doesn't make for a good photo, you know, whereas, and this is the thing that, I sort of came to realize um, I, uh, probably, especially when I, when I started to really get into holistic management and even before that, um, just started to really heavily question the, uh, the whole value of less is more. And that took me back to some of the earlier re writings of Masanobu Fukuoka, who I read when I was 18 or 19 and took his doing nothing um, proposal fairly seriously, but, yeah. <laughs> but you know, but when I when I reflected on that later, I thought, well, actually, doing nothing is sometimes the best thing that you can do, and right. applying a management sense. So this is where I came to the point where I said, well, look, a lot of people take a big D development approach um, as opposed to a big M management approach, and the big M management is stuff that you can't necessarily see. It's it's maybe the the increased root volume of grasses that you have in the landscape, which are sequestering carbon and infiltrating water at a level that no swale can even compete with. Um, it's it's the, the lack of cost that you've just imposed on your client. It's maybe getting some social tweaks in their relationships, which are gonna ultimately make them happier. Um, it might be some financial stuff. It, 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 might, it might be just a bit of wire and it might be just a bit of water pipe and that's all that's required. And it might be a tree. It might be a tree here and there, or trees here and there. But you know, you don't necessarily have to go the big wow straight up. Um, I think that taking a take an approach where soil carbon is going to be the by, soil carbon development is going to be the byproduct of your management and time. If that's where you, if if that's an outcome of that time, as opposed to lots of things. Yeah, you know, the yeah. bright shiny yeah. lights. Um, then that's that to me is uh, it, to me in most cases is a much more feasible outcome. Yeah, I've, I've thought about that. And um, my I have a background in community development, and and in community development, you learn that if if you come from a if you do a top down decision making, whatever program you're implementing tends not to, tend not to work. Yeah. Um, and then, so when I started studying these things, I was having a look at it as well. And what I found, um, I think it complements what you're saying, is that people started copying permaculture institutes. And the institute, the way that they were found, they were found to demonstrate a lot of things. Not yeah. necessarily because they needed to, but the yeah. technique needed to be there. 
Yeah. And people, yeah. and then someone in a farm that didn't need that many features would go around and say, oh, I need all that because otherwise it's not permaculture or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bill Mollison said something similar to me years ago. He said, because uh, I went to a farm that was clearly designed by him because it had all of his signatures over it. Um, and that, the clients didn't know they were second owners or something. And I said to Bill, oh, I bet, went to this farm, I think you designed. He goes, yeah, I remember that one, blah, blah, blah. And he said, oh, I remember, he said, I remember when we released Permaculture One and Permaculture One, I don't know if you remember, it's all these concentric circles. Yeah. And he said, he said, this is how people are. They took that and they were, I went to properties and people did exactly that. Like they, the book they, cover, they developed their property like a book cover. And I thought, wow, isn't that, but that's, that's influenced us with the writing of the Rigorian's handbook. Um, the responsibility that you take on, when you write a piece and people are paying attention to what you do, um, that you really, really need to be clear um, because people will copy this stuff. That is a phenomena out there. It's a good point. Some, some people read the text, but not the context. Yeah. Or, or just look at the photos. <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> look common. At, yeah. Look at the diagrams. Yeah. yeah.